Okay, everybody, we'll get started here. We have uh, Charles Parker, he's an adjunct professor at the University of Michigan and Thomas Edison State University, and he's going to be talking about uh, risks with cab connected and autonomous vehicles, GPS and LiDAR attacks, and many issues. Now, I'll go ahead and leave these out for you guys to look at uh, during or after. This is a radar unit that we have in the AP vehicles. This is a LiDAR unit. I don't know if anybody's ever seen them before. So, they're here. If we can just keep those uh, out of camera range, I really appreciate it. I don't want my life to get interesting. Uh, so, today, we're going to talk about GPS and LiDAR the different attacks to them and how to defend against these attacks. All right, so I'm Charles Parker II, uh, a few graduate degrees, uh, I got a certificate and other coursework from Ivy League schools. Very exciting, very expensive. Um, now, I may be a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. But I'm not your lawyer. And so that'll come into play a little bit later. I'll explain how that applies. Presently, I work as a cybersecurity lab engineer for a tier one manufacturer. So we'll get modules that come in, and uh, our job is to attack them, um, you know, break them down into the, into the boards, look at the circuits, the leads, try to pull firmware off of them, try to put uh, nasty messages in them so they don't work anymore and then report all the vulnerabilities back to our client uh, and also how to mediate them. So we're not just saying, well, you guys screwed up. We're saying, these are some vulnerabilities. It may be in your best interest to fix them unless you want to be in the paper. The, uh, I am on Twitter. Uh, I, I used to put most everything I do on my publications and everything on Twitter, but lately it's just been on uh, my blog. Now later, later, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, please feel free to email me. Uh, I think I have most of the Charles part of the seconds. Uh, Yahoo, Gmail, Outlook, Proton, Mail. Um, I probably missed a couple, but if you hit any of those, I will respond. I promise. My focus is to make try to make this place better for everyone. A safer environment, a better environment, so we can go on the internet and not have to worry as much. So you can drive your car and not have to worry about uh, the bad actor attacking a fleet and crashing into you. And that's my blog. I don't want my blog. All right, so there's a lot to cover and so this isn't death by PowerPoint. I have a lot of pictures I want to share with you and a lot of information. Uh, do not, seriously, do not try this at home. By an airport, by an ambulance service, by the police, anybody, unless you're authorized. Your life can get very interesting very quickly. There are people who drive black sedans that don't like what we do sometimes at government agencies. Uh, the content of this presentation is mine. For, and uh, it, you ever notice you get this disclaimer before they show you how to do something dangerous? This is for educational purposes only. Uh, this is my opinion. Uh, it has nothing to do with my employer. I promise. The, the, what we're going to go over today is not intended to be a substitute for you getting professional advice and uh, uh, contracting with someone uh, for education purposes only. Uh, any of the testing that we go over should actually be done by a professional who's been doing it so you don't get surprises. Uh, if, you, if you get professional advice, please don't ignore it. You like to get interesting in a totally different way. Uh, rely, uh, relying on this information is not your own risk, like usual. 
informational purposes only. Exciting. So the recommendations are not guaranteed for future performance. So whatever we go over today, if a new technology comes out tomorrow, today's information may not be good or as good going forward. Oh, this is a good one. Unauthorized hacking is illegal. Illegal. And in some cases may be considered terrorism. Please only do it if you've been authorized and you have a contract signed in hand by authorized personnel. Uh, you don't want to get a visit from the 5 or a three-letter agency. So uh, Jason Street, I don't know if you've ever met him or been at a venue with him, very smart person. The one thing from the quote that I picked up on is, what did you do? What did you do today to make things better? Which is why you know, I give presentations, why I teach, it's why I have too many degrees. So it's not red versus blue. It's red and blue working together. So it's not, uh, after you did that with your pen test, it's not, I pulled you so hard, you're going back to the ice age. It's more, these are the vulnerabilities, let's work together to fix them. One's productive, one is so background, with vehicles and anything that's connected, we're all moving at a breakneck speed towards more connectivity in the AD vehicles, autonomous drive. We're seeing it on the roads now, especially in Metro Detroit. There are, uh, so in Ann Arbor, you have the driverless shuttle. Um, May Mobility has a driverless shuttle in Metro Detroit. Uh, one of the major roads in Metro is Telegraph. There's a bus line that's been driving a planned route along that for about three years now. It's, it's autonomous, there's a human there in the seat just in case. But this has been running and operating for years now. With these, it's not just that it's the technology being applied to these. The users are demanding it, and they're voting with their dollars. They're buying the cars that are more connected, that have a better user experience. And that's not going to slow down. Everybody's looking forward toward the AD vehicles like you see in the movies, like uh, iRobot, we just get in and go. That's where, that's where we're going. It's not going to be here as soon as we and the users want, but it is coming. And with the vehicles, with the sensors we have on there now, so we have LiDAR, radar, cameras, and a few other sensors. Right now, they're only generating 6T of data a day. When, as we advance more, put more and better sensors on, there's going to be a lot more data generated every day. And so that's something else for everybody to think about. What are you going to do with the data? How do you get it from the car to the, uh, to the OEM, to their cloud, wherever it's going for analysis? We don't cover that. That's another thing to think about. Also, farm equipment. You've seen the, the uh, equipment out there in the fields. A number of different uses for it. Soil sampling, weed location, Accurate planting, accurate down to centimeter planting, planting for the crops, uh, and that's not even that's not even half of all uh, the applications you can have for farm equipment. So, in a vehicle, people that are out there just now, there's a number of sensors. Each sensor is important. Each sensor has its own job. Uh, so LiDAR, radar, cameras, and others. Each of these, as they operate, passive and actively, are uh, pulling data from the environment. Each data point they use as not just something to accumulate. They're taking the data points and building a map so that the vehicle can decide what's in front of it, what's around it, what, it, what the, the intent is for the vehicle not to run into a tree or a human or a stop sign. So what it does is it takes all the data points from all the sensors, accumulates them, 
analyzes them and correlates in between them. So if two of the three sensors say, oh, there's a tree right in front of you, based on the coding for the vehicle, it takes action based on that. So it's not just one sensor says, oh, there's a tree, and all the other ones say, well, no, you're clear. It takes all that into account. For the LiDAR, there are a bunch of manufacturers. The LiDAR's been around for forever, it seems like. And these are some of the big ones, Velodyne, Mobileye. Um, those are two of the, the more prevalent ones that you'll see out there. But there are many more than this. There's some pictures of them. So why LiDAR? Of all the different sensors that are out there. Why are, why are we using LiDAR? Right. So, in my initial thought was I was watching Elon Musk and uh, at his one of his last meetings he was just going off about LiDAR and said only fools will use LiDAR in the future. And just, he, he spent about 30 minutes on why LiDAR is useless. Um, but it's, it's not totally useless. There are issues with it, we'll go over that. But LiDAR is used as, uh, as part of the layer of sensors in the vehicle that are gathering information about the environment. Alone, maybe they're not that great, but used in conjunction with everything else, they work perfectly fine, and it's a good additional point to use. They work in the daytime and nighttime. These, are, these have been refined to the point where they can recognize where you are in the lane. Uh, the vehicles now have lane assist, so if you uh, uh, start to go over one way or another, you get a little nudge in the seat to wake you up. That's one of the present uses. Uh, they can recognize license plates, street signs, and of course humans, because you don't want to run over a human. Now, active, uh, they, this is a, considered an active uh, sensor because it's sending the pulse out waiting for the pulse to come back for the data point. It's not waiting for some input just to come in randomly. All right, so we've looked at why LiDAR. So let's look at why not LiDAR. It's, uh, it is exceptionally vulnerable to attack, unfortunately. But the, this with the current versions that are out there now. It's not perfect. Nothing really is. Um, one of the first big publications uh, on this was uh, presented at Black Hat 2015 by Jonathan, and I'm gonna mess his last name up, name up I think it's the T. Uh, he's involved with M-City. If you want more information about uh, vehicle cybersecurity, a good source is M-City. If you uh, go to Dr. Google, uh, you can use University of Michigan M-City and it'll pull up all the information and all the publications. But they have a whole mock city set up with uh, street signs, street lights, uh, buildings, so that if you have an AD vehicle, a time to drive, you can test it. It's pretty neat. But anyway, I digress. So in his research, he was able to remotely tamper with the camera and the LiDAR. So the camera was mobile one of their models. LiDAR was uh, IDEO. What he was able, and I mean, that's kind of redundant, but what he was able to do, and this is a, one of the images from his paper, <laughs> he was able to, through the attack, generate a false wall around the vehicle. So the sensor, the LiDAR and the camera sensor, it thought that there was a wall around it, so it wouldn't be able to drive through the area since they thought it perceived there was a wall around it. And unfortunately, that's somewhat easy to do. Still. So with the target, we're talking about LiDAR, so with the target, I was looking at, well, what's one of the major manufacturers? So there's Velodyne. They have a number of different models. Here are two right here. And you would think, well, these are going on the AD vehicles. It's got to be somewhat hard to 
get get one of the modules. I mean, you just can't go to uh, Walmart and buy one. But unfortunately, it's not really not that it wasn't that difficult. Uh, so there are many manufacturers, many targets per manufacturer. So what you can do is just contact them, and uh, that's what I did on the top. Uh, I just reached out to their inside sales, and they just got back to me you know, with the usual, hey, is there anything else we can do for you? So my next question was going to, would be, well, yeah, I'd like to buy one of these. And I work for, you know, makeup, whatever company. Um, so the two of the models that you probably see with vehicles that are out there are the Puck and the HDL-64E LiDAR. Now the Puck, I've got one here. If you want to look at it later, feel free. Uh, it's pretty basic. Um, you know, depending on how much cash you want to spend, how much uh, money you're burning in your pocket, you can buy a puck for about thirty-two hundred. Or if you're really excited, you can go and get the uh, HDL model on the right. Uh, <coughs> on the left is what you probably see more on consumer vehicles. Um, the HDL unit on the right, that's the one you usually see on the top of vehicle spinning. Like for a, a, a Google, I think the Google vehicles use those a lot. But yeah, it's they both pretty much have the same function, but it's just the, how advanced do you want to get, how excited do you want to get about the testing. So to start the test, the pen test. Uh, the first step is to do your recon. So you want to know, uh, you want to find out everything you can without being too intrusive and setting off the red flags. So naturally, I went online like everybody else. I went to Dr. Google, and just typed in a basic, rudimentary search. I didn't do any uh, uh, Google dorks with it. Nothing. Just like anybody else could type it. Uh, so it was just a general internet search, nothing exciting. So I was able to get data sheets, manuals, everything I needed to make my life easier as I was going forward with the test. Now with the manuals, you one would think, well they've got those buttoned down pretty well these days. You know, with all the uh, attacks that have been out there with the automakers, with uh, AWS, everything else, you think, well you know, they're going to blot out certain data that they don't want everybody to see. Well, that's usually, unfortunately, not the case. You, so as you go out there in the different manuals, what you can do is look for default passwords, configuration files, and other data that will make your life easier. And so I just happened across a, uh, uh, a manual and a few data sheets. So here's one of the data sheets that, or uh, this is a sheet from the data packet, right? So this is from a much larger document. I think it was 50, 60 pages. Germain. Uh, I, and I got, I was able to secure these documents with a, just a general internet search. I didn't do anything uh, exciting that would get me in trouble with anybody. I did not uh, acquire this through other means. All right, so just take a look at it just for uh, you know, under a minute, though. But can you see anything on here that would be exciting that you might use if you, you were just uh, were intent on hacking one of the modules? The wavelength. Yeah, yeah. I also, you know, the wavelength, I also looked at what I thought was funny. And probably modulation. That and the, uh, the contents the, 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 the packets. Why would anybody need to know that that wasn't on the dev team? But, you know, thank you. I appreciate it. That's not hard to discover without that, though. Yeah. Yeah, but it's one less thing, one less hurdle, one less thing for me to do. I mean, if they're going to if they're gonna give you data, I certainly will take it. So I don't have to discover it. I don't have to, I don't even have to think about it. It's right there. And so it's a few other things. And this is all this is all free range. 
You can pull all the data you want, learn everything you want about all this. So with the detects, uh, the information that you need to do, that you need to start and do the planning is easy to get. <coughs> Not that difficult. And so with the attacks, there are usually two ways to look at it, internal and external. So the internal is, uh, so you have access to the in inside of the vehicle or the vehicle itself. You're able to sit in it, pull the dash back, uh, plug into the uh, uh, USB, uh, OBD, whatever you want. You're able to manipulate the hardware of the vehicle for an extended period of time. External are more the attacks where you're sitting next to the expressway, you're sitting next to the neighborhood. You're not right. You're not right there with the vehicle. So if they have a ring doorbell or other monitoring, they don't have you on video in their car tearing it apart trying to connect to something. I tend to focus more on the external attacks, like just like somebody. Uh, just like a, a bad actor would. Um, if you have a Tesla and it's parked in a parking lot, you're more likely to try to connect to it from 100 meters away. You're not as likely to get up next to the car, try the door, get in it, and start tearing stuff apart to try to connect with uh, the can in the car. Oh, that's my... That's my captain. This is that's my captain. Obvious quote: Criminals don't want to get caught, so that's why generally it's more of the external attack. So with the Tesla, and an example of this, so you have the Tesla hack by Tencent. This was their first really big attack for them. Uh, what they were able to do: they secured a Tesla, they pulled it, and you know how the dash is, right? It's a huge piece of plastic. They were able to pull it back, examine everything, they saw a port plugged into it, and that's how they were able to, through their research, uh, get published and show they had an attack on, on the Tesla. That's a very busy attack. Everybody can see what you're doing. Uh, and the time element, this, this took a lot of time for them to execute. Uh, so the first attack, is sensor saturation. So the LiDAR unit is exposed. Uh, usually you can see it on the front of the car. Um, there'll be a section of the, usually, a section of the grill that's exposed, and you'll see something, uh, a circle or what have you there. That's the, well, that's one area. Um, I have some other pictures of where they're attached to the uh, side view mirrors of the car. So you have the mirror and they attach them to the bottom of the mirror. And they're pretty, uh, they're pretty sleek. They're not as big as this one. You can see, I mean, that one's pretty heavy and tall. The ones that they have in the vehicles now are a lot smaller, but you'll see them there as you're driving, driving down the road. And sometimes you have to look because they blend in that well. And okay, so you know where the so you know where the sensors are on the vehicle. So what you can do is once you have the wavelength of the laser, point the laser right at it to oversaturate the module. So the module is sending out pulses and waiting for pulses to come back at a regular interval because that's what it's programmed to do. But if you have a strong enough laser you can't saturate it, so it's always receiving the what, they, what it thinks is the pulse. So it's a lot like a, a, a DOS attack, or if you have multiple, a DDoS attack. So it's only expecting, you know, whatever the pulse is, and it's just, it's saturated. It's, it's receiving uh, a pulse, but it's perceiving as a pulse all the time. So the attack tools, there are a couple different options if, you're, if you want to do this. Uh, the first is if you want to use a weaker laser, it costs around $40. If you're excited, you can spend up to $350 just on a basic laser, but you have to match it up with the wavelength. 
Uh, there will be some assembly required with this. It's not too uh, extravagant. Now, if you're not a uh, DIY person, you can always buy uh, equipment to do it. There would be some modification with this if you wanted to use this instead. Uh, in Metro, this and other units are sold locally, and the vendors are more than happy to sell you all you want to buy. This was only under a grand, I think, when I was looking at it for the, for the test. So it's not, it's still not, um, it won't break the bank for you to do the test. Now sensor spoofing, this is a little different. So with the saturation, it's receiving a constant pulse. So it's, 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 uh, it's uh, confused on what's going on. Uh, with sensor spoofing, it's a little different. So you're again deceiving the, the module. So instead of a tree being 100 meters away, what you can do is make the car believe that uh, there's a tree closer, there's uh, another object closer or further away. And again, this doesn't cost this much. Two pieces, of, two pieces of hardware that you're going to you would integrate into uh, your test kit: a photodiode and a pulse laser diode. You have with this with this version, you have to buy both. I don't have the prices. Oh, dollar, so under twenty bucks for that part. Uh, so you'd have to use them together. Uh, you'd also have to have a driver to instruct the uh, hardware hardware hardware, how to work, what kind of pulse to send, timing-wise, so it picks up a pulse image. So what you're doing is, you're telling the module that there's something in, in its way that's really not there. So you're constructing for the module another data point, another set of data points, or something, whatever you want to put around it, like a fence or a wall. Uh, relaying, this is another type of the tag. Pretty, pretty much the same thing. So again, you're putting out a false image to the module. So you can see there's several ways to do this, unfortunately. That's why you need many sensors there to grab all of the points so everything can correlate. Uh, yeah, from Animal House, for those of a certain vintage, like me. So there's several defenses, though, out there to help with this, so to make these more safe. Uh, and there's defenses for, uh, for the different modules that are out there, for the radar, for the GPS, cameras. So when, you, when I say all is not lost, there are defenses and things to help with this. So you can have redundancy, you can have lasers with, within the same type. You can have lasers with uh, different wavelengths. This makes it more difficult, more time consuming for the attacker to put something together. Uh, it, 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 it does increase the cost, not exponentially, but there is an increased cost with it since you have to buy more equipment. Uh, and also, there would probably be more persons involved with the attack. And you know, based on what you're doing, if you're doing an approved pen test, it's not a big deal. If you're not doing an approved pen test, that would probably be a bigger deal. Another thing you can do is random probing. So remember earlier from the data sheet, uh, the pulses were sent out with regularity. Or regular, regularity. So the module knew when, it, when the pulses were going to come back in to expect them and put the data points uh, in its internal mapping. So another thing you can do, instead of the fixed interval, change that up. Now, if you're an attacker, that'll give you a headache trying to figure out that out, unless you're able to get, um, scan it, and receive enough of the pulses from the unit so you know uh, what the uh, protocol is. 
but you know, again, that's another step. And usually, bad actors are looking for the low hanging fruit, not to put uh, an extreme amount of time into it. You know, unless they're looking for 15 minutes of fame and blackout. Uh, yeah, it makes the attack more difficult based on the time. Okay, so that's it for LiDAR. We're going to go into GPS. GPS has been around for decades, literally decades. It's been used by the DOD geez, since at least the 80s. Uh, the old GPS units, when I was in service, were these big monsters that took a huge battery. You had to change the battery, battery quite regularly. So it was a hassle when you're in the field carrying all this extra weight. But with vehicles, it's a relatively new application. Um, it has been out there for a few years, but not a lot of people have been exposed to it. Um, and there are still people who are mistaken about it and its uses. And I have a quote here, uh, GPS spoofing, I shouldn't, I have a quote, I shouldn't say I have a quote, Parkinson, Ward, Wilson, and Miller have a quote. GPS spoofing is quite a complex procedure. It involves broadcasting incorrect, realistic, and valid GPS signals Sleeve GPS receivers. Um, the quote in your White House, no, no, no. This is, although this is a, a relatively new application, the tool isn't new, uh, the attack vector is somewhat new. Okay, fun with G, fun, as, as fun as you can make GPS, right? Um, so the vehicle has to be aware of the surroundings at all times, especially the AD vehicles. You don't want to be in a car, fully autonomous, driving around, hoping it knows where it's going. Uh, um, that's like a wish sandwich. It's not going to work out very well for you. It needs to know where the other cars are, where the road is, uh, pedestrians, trees, everything. Uh, when I was going through this, I, I remembered watching The Office about a year ago, two years ago, one of the reruns. And uh, they gave an example of what can happen when you, what can happen when you have a bad GPS. So they, uh, they were driving to an old client's place, an attorney's office, and they didn't know where it was, so they just plugged the coordinates into their GPS. And uh, so they're driving along, and it says, take a right. And so uh, uh, the other guy says, no, no, there's a pond there. You don't want to take a right. He's like, no, the GPS says take a right. So they take a right into the pond. But I'm, if you're doing that horrible disservice, it's funny when you watch it. <laughs> so this isn't an isolated issue. GPS spoofing is kind of a big deal. Uh, this story was out, oh, just April, just this last April 1st. Now, it wasn't an April Fool's joke. They, uh, they uh, uh, were quasi busted doing the GPS spoofing. There's the there's the site for it, and I'm not trying to do be a fud person. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, this is published by a third party, respected party. And just in case, what I did was I found other sources for the same story, different. BBC. That's a uh, nice somewhat uh, independent source so this the spoofing is going on by nations by nation states but also by people so as I mentioned the vehicle needs to know its location at all times you don't want any surprises uh, surprise when you're driving a vehicle like that is, is really bad um, a couple issues that may be with the signal are the the ionosphere may not be conducive to GPS because of the uh, satellite feed. And also large buildings, like if you're in downtown Chicago, they could block some of the signal. Uh, and there also happens to be the attackers out there looking to negatively impact several vehicles all at the same time. Uh, so here's some of the equipment if you wanted to do it. Uh, so this is based on research of Nick Upton. Uh, I also worked with him on this. Um, it's not costly or cumbersome to spoof GPS. 
and really mess with people. Uh, the assembly isn't tough. You can have, uh, let's see, so for your SDR, software defined radio, you can use a hack RF or a blade RF, and there's a, uh, pictures of both of those from the manufacturer there. Uh, you want some kind of case, it's like a plastic case. You can even 3D print it if you want, so you don't have to buy it. Uh, an antenna, uh, the antenna in the upper right, that's just a stock photo. You'd probably want to use something uh, better for this type of attack of bigger antenna. Uh, and a Linux OS. And coding, coding the scripts for it's not that bad either. You can download them if you want. And what we would what we like to do, uh, we've gave, given a presentation a few times, is that we spoof our location so it's in Russia. 100 meters above Chernobyl. So somehow we were able, if you want to believe GPS in that case, we were able to put a car 100 meters in the air above the uh, old reactors. Uh, and we weren't in Russia when we did it. Are we only spoofing one satellite or more than one satellite? We spoof? It depends. If you're using the uh, blade RF, the top one, what you can do is but what we did was, uh, depending on the proximity, we use an amplifier or not. But what you can do is use two of those and do up to the new model. I think you can do, if you use two of them, four satellites. Because you would need at least four in order for something to consider a valid position. Well, what we did was, in the presentation, we were so close. We only, where we were at, we really couldn't blast it. So we just used the laptop, we didn't amplify it, but everybody was so close that the signal, especially on iPhone, would read that we were in Russia. Like with the, with the Android, it would pick that up and the signal was so strong, it would use that and more than the other seven that it would pick up. You can't establish the position with geometry unless you have an intersection of, you need more than one latitude, longitude point, because your, your, your position is dependent on the intersection of, you know, this satellite's here, this satellite's here, this satellite's here, and you're where the intersects. Yeah. yeah, but it also depends on the strength of the signal. It's not just, it's the number, right? Because you can have, you can have your app that shows all the different satellites you're picking up with the with the uh, reception of each and the power of each. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, they've written bad software. If they think they can determine the location with just a line of sight from one, from the angle and the distance from one, yeah. one satellite. Yeah. But when we were doing it, especially with the iPhones, it would pick up that that was the location uh -huh. using just the uh, yeah, the blade on that. Interesting. Yeah. A lot of GPS receivers use 22 to get a low precision because it needs three points of intersection and they use the curvature of the earth as the third. Hmm. So if you get a low precision. It, it depends. Yeah. Yeah, nothing that I that I use would I mean why fly, but yeah. there shouldn't be a valid position. Yeah. When we were doing it, they were picking up, picking up on their phones, and specifically with the iPhones, they were uh, still showing they were in Russia over an hour. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm going to have to be able to work that way. That's what I'm trying to. Yeah, yeah. To, to be able to do a, an attack like that, you need to know like your current position to get things right, or is it just something that you? No. When we did, it, we just put the new whatever new location we wanted. That's all we used. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Another thing we did, we showed them, was that you know the Pokemon Go game from a few years ago. How you can, I'm not even sure how that works, but you get the little, I guess, creatures, whatever they're called. Oh, I, I'm too busy with research, but. Uh, so uh, Nick was able to just sit in his living room 
change of coordinates, and he was able to get all the Pokemon creatures, he said, within a couple hours, just by sitting on his couch watching TV. He showed his, this is how he is, he showed his daughter how to do it too, and so he got all the, the Pokemon, Pokemon, whatever, for his kid too, at the same time. So the methodology for the attack is not static as technology advances, so does the attack, so do the attacks. Uh, we're working on different types of attacks. Um, yeah, so you can change your coordinates, the thing the vehicle's in the long lane, so it goes to try to correct itself into the other traffic. Uh, in Metro Detroit, we have I-75, which is the, the B way in and B way out during the morning and you know at night as people drive from north into Detroit. That could really, if you were for an external attack, if you were so inclined, what you could do is just sit by the side of the road and you know use two, three blade RFs and then spoof the location. I mean that may not be as drastic now. But think about it in 10 years when we have more AD vehicles on the road. If you want to mess with the whole fleet in the same location. Uh, all right, and this is one of the things we did. We may have done, sorry, we didn't have this. We may or may not have had FCC approval. So without an amplifier, just an antenna going out of the roof of the building, we had a, we had a uh, the lab we were at, had a Faraday cage around three sides, the, the uh, cement. We didn't have a Faraday cage under that. We had to have a hole through the roof. And uh, we were able to go about a quarter mile away and still pick up the signal just from a laptop with the normal antenna. We didn't amplify it. We wanted just a baseline uh, reading. So we're about a quarter mile away, line of sight, and the signal still from that was stronger than the other seven satellites he was picking up. So if you really wanted to get excited, put an amplifier on it and reach even further. Uh, this, could cut, this could affect planes, vehicles, ships, yeah, uh, phones, drones. Virtually anything using GPS, you can affect it. And again, don't try this at home unless you're authorized. It's not that hard to get authorized. So some of the defenses, uh, you can build a defense that's perfect, that will exclude any attack, but it will cost too much, and it will make the vehicle uh, difficult to operate. So you have to find some happy medium with this. Um, you have to have, find a practical defense that you can implement through a fleet. For instance, GM. You have to find something that GM, for instance, would want to use through all the vehicles. So one option is to use two GPS antennas on both, uh, not, real, not close to each other in the vehicle, but separated out on two different bands. Uh, with that, that will give you enough of a differential so that that'll be a valid defense. So if you have a, that a, if you are being attacked, this system should be able to pick it up. Uh, drift monitoring. This is um, this is one of the ones that I've been pushing more. So if you're driving along and it says you're in Dearborn, GPS says you're in Dearborn. I'm in Dearborn. I'm in Dearborn. I'm in Mississippi. There's a problem. So just for this uh, few lines of code within uh, uh, the module, it can, it can, it should be able to pick up where there's an error. We, because obviously you can't drive from Dearborn, Michigan, to uh, say Mississippi, Mississippi, within a few minutes. So in that case, the algorithm would pick it up and say, "Oh, there's a problem," and go to some of the other modules that are in it uh, and data. You know, that's more of the data points in depth. So the vehicle knows where it's at at all times. 
we have can drive from Dallas to Boulder in four months. So that's, that's really all it would look at. Uh, Geometry-based attacks. That's a little more advanced and costly. Oh yeah, there's. Yeah. So vendors are selling hardware to bypass this. It's expensive. Um, it's really expensive and probably not something that uh, uh, Joe Hacker would buy. But it, that is out there. Uh, spectral subtraction model, that's another algorithm based. So you have how it, you know, how it basically works is you have a baseline signal, you look at the other signal coming in, you look at the differential. If one of the other signals is vastly above that, with above your margin of error, then you know, then the vehicle knows oh, something's going on. Somebody's trying to uh, attack the GPS in the vehicle. That's another algorithm based check, like the drift or the plausibility. And I'm running out of time. So this just came in the other day from Regulus. Uh, apparently, and I wasn't able to get any data, so this is a, a, another disclaimer, but this is just from them. Regulus, Regulus has a product that allegedly will defend against uh, GPS attack. I haven't had a chance to look at any of the white papers, any of the data on it. It was just a lot of uh, marketing buzzwords with the email. So it, it may work, it may not. I don't know. You know, it's like when uh, uh, the marketing people come out and say they have AI in the product, and uh, right then you start thinking, well, maybe I should ask a few more questions. But the salesperson will be able to give you more data. So, but this is uh, that's one of the new, new really products that's out there. Closing. If you have any questions, concerns, please get a hold of me. Uh, always doing research. Yep. So for aviation, uh, and it doesn't cost a whole lot. I think um, they're probably what less than fifty bucks for a loss receiver for a Raspberry Pi. Oh yeah, it's not even that. So that's a correction signal that's sent from a land-based uh, terminal. Uh, it's retransmitted from the GPS satellites, and you can receive that. And if you were spoofing and claiming that your satellite number is such and such, right? and you receive so an that's integrity the, signal. That's the authentication check against. Right, that's that's really inexpensive. It wouldn't be anything for people to put that in a car if they wanted to. Yeah, that would be cheap too. Cheap and pretty easy to put in. Yeah, and it's already built in. It's built into the national airspace system. I mean, and like he and I were just talking about, you can get one of those for a Raspberry Pi even. Just to put on top. Yeah, what's it? Wow. It's called WASP, Wide Area Augmentation System. Okay. And it's a signal that's broadcast right now. Yeah, I've, I've only looked at mostly the vehicle aspects, but yeah, that doesn't come up. But yeah, but you can play with you, it, doesn't cost much to experiment with. No, not at all. Yeah. All right, thanks. Are, are there any other, uh, like, tertiary or the other ways of knowing location that have been used for cars? I'm just thinking of like cell phone tower triangulation and some of some they, they, Yeah, they have been using cell phone towers um, and they have uh, they have specific cell phone see, I don't know what I can tell you about what we're doing. There are specific cell phone towers that are triangulated with that the vehicle triangulates with at specific sites. So it's not all of them from what we're testing. But then that's further out still for the AD vehicles. I mean, the, uh, I mean we're, t we're testing them now, um, entire vehicles and the modules. But it's, with it still being, you know, GPS has been out, like I said, for decades. So I've, you know, we've been using it forever. But the, uh, in vehicles, there's still a lot of learning to be done. And we're, unfortunately, our industry, we're not cross-pollinating ideas. 
for some reason, we all think that we're all smarter than everybody else, and we all want to recreate the wheel for ourselves. You know, between IP and you know, management, it's, there, are there are better ways to handle the issue than how we're actually handling it. But that's where we're at. So Ford said where they'd have their uh, AD vehicle right next to you in 2021. They said, we'll have, and this was a few years ago, we'll have our AD vehicle out there for you to drive. We're going to sell it, you know, buzzwords and everything. But they're not, not even Ford, Ford or BMW. BMWs are fans too. They're not even ready yet. But when it comes down, it's coming down. Probably not in my lifetime. There'll be there'll be any vehicles out there. All right, thank you. Thank and uh, thanks for coming out to the conference. Uh, you know, time is a commodity. The older I get, the more I appreciate time. So thanks for coming out.